Hello once again, and I apologize for that gross interruption in my reading from Andrew Piper's Lost Girls. I don't know what happened. I started to touch the microphone a little bit because I realized it was a little bit far away and as it dragged across my desk and, and touched some wires, everything went off. I, 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 need, I probably need some new equipment. Um, uh, or maybe the plug-in, it gets a little loose and I don't know, for whatever reason it stopped. However, it didn't, it stopped, but I was able to then save what was there. So that's, that's what we're seeing. Also, my camera seems brighter now than it was. Anyway, without further ado, let me take you back, uh, if I can find it again, to, uh, to that wonderful, it's so funny. I mean, I hope you were enjoying it because I just think it's hilarious. So I'll go back to, yeah, his fatness tells a story. On Goodwin's pink layers and crimson cheeks is written the history of a man who once believed that when he'd reached a certain point of accomplishment in his life, when he could stand knowing that his own words represented the voice of queen and country, that then, after years of schoolyard mockery and half-concealed giggles over his shoulder, he would be taken seriously. But here he is, finally, and nothing has changed. <laughs> okay, see how lyrical the writing is? There's a Dickensian quality to Piper's writing. Um, and that, that's such a, a graphic description of this massively corpulent man. It also tells you a lot about the, the character of the narrator, uh, his cynical worldview, his, his uh, unsympathetic portrayal of others, and his ability to read people. Um, his, his ability to read posture, body language, and so on is one of the things that has made him uh, an, a successful attorney. I want to read you something else um, that, that I found really interesting about it because it dovetailed so closely with my own career and may lead to a bit of introspection such that I might have to leave the magus. No, I'll keep going. So... Here, although I was alone, I don't remember being lonely, never popular, but respected from a distance in the way that derisive, slightly feared young men can be. Yeah. And so when I went to university, when the trust fund finally kicked in after I turned 19, there wasn't the usual cast of mentors to advise me on what course of study to take, and I had no strong in inclinations of my own. I didn't have a trust fund, but I do relate to a lot here. It must have been some kind of subconscious tribute to the old man when I signed up to major in English when it came time to register. Four years of British verse, French theory, American novels, and all around me girls morphed into talking panthers I dared not speak to. Then law school, for all the usual reasons, legitimacy, money, a safe reservoir for undistinguished intelligence. Mm. But it turned out to be far more compatible than I imagined. My passion for words finally married to an indifference to truth. For me, law school was the discovery of religion, albeit a godless one, with its Latin prayers and shifting manufactured convictions. Belief, the weight of the air in your lungs. Of course, not all of my classmates experienced their legal education the same way I did. Many even arrived with declared intentions of, quote, doing some good out there or making changes from within the system. But there was much less of that kind of talk by the time graduation rolled around. And it was a good thing, too. The rest of us, having found the spectacle of diminished moral ambitions rather embarrassing and sad, like watching a man with a wooden leg take dance lessons. Then the purchase of suits, and all of my classmates drifting away into marriage or property or the pursuit of expensive, rather indulged, rarely indulged hobbies. Whether due to my suspicious bachelorhood or success in releasing unpredictably violent offenders back into the world, I have no longer asked to their late bloomer weddings, housewarmings, or if such things still go on, cocktail parties. Although occasionally curious, I miss none of them. I assume all of us are happy in our ways. I feel like he was practically writing my own autobiography for me. If I ever want to write my memoirs, I'll probably ask him to be my ghostwriter. 
I partic- I really want to focus in though on this. Um, it, but it turned out to be far more compatible than I imagined. My passion for words finally married to an indifference to truth. For me, law school was the discovery of religion, albeit a godless one, with its Latin prayers and shifting manufactured convictions. I never went into law saying, I want to do some good out there or making changes from within the system. No, I was interested mainly in, well, to be honest, I did it because I was too afraid to be, try to go out there and try to become an actor. But um, the law seemed someone of my, what was it? Someone of, of uh, intelligent, but of uh, indistinguished, <laughs> non-distinguished brilliance or something, a safe reservoir for an intellect of, of undistinguished something or other. I can relate to that. Um, but uh, here was my biggest problem and discovery with law school that it was com- that uh, and for, for the practice of law because I got into litigation I wasn't the guy that you come to to write contracts and all that sort of thing I was the kind of guy that was there when you got into trouble or there was a civil suit and that sort of thing but although I w- had a kind of cynical worldview and and like this guy um, was definitely quite a, a libertine uh, in my youth and still grapple with a kind of hedonistic impulse even in, now in my 40s um, I still have always believed in truth. I still have always believed in God, though I never knew him nor, nor particularly cared to. And it was really interesting to me to see how many lawyers were atheists um, that I encountered, nearly just about all of them, with one or two exceptions. But even the ones that did believe tended not to be in litigation. I can only think of one who was, and... I don't know. How compromised he was is something that only he knows. But um, that passion for truth is what actually pushed me away from law. As soon as I realized what a cynical game of just (laughs) Talmudic-like one-upmanship with each other, where the only goal is to win. It's not to find out what the truth was. It was never to find out what really happened. It was just simply to dominate your opponent. And just like this guy says in other parts of the book, he doesn't care about guilt or innocence. He only cares about winning. I experienced that firsthand as a lawyer, and it it repulsed me. Um, I had, through the grace of God, in my last year of law school, discovered Christianity. I'd been raised an Anglican, but I never took it seriously. But in my last couple of years of law school, those were the times when the new atheists, Dawkins, Hitchens, Dennett, Sam Harris, were writing. And I couldn't stand them. I, I was so put off by their tone, by their rhetoric, and by the fact they were spouting ridiculously poor arguments that even though I shared their disbelief, I, I just knew that what they were saying was facile and flimsy and easily rebuttable with just a, a, a modicum of logical thinking and challenging their presuppositions and premises. So I started reading people like Alistair McGrath. He was the first one I ever read. It was called Dawkins' God, something like that. And that led me to spending hours in this, up in Durham, in this cathedral, wrestling with the God I didn't believe in, um, asking questions of myself so that eventually when I was doing my my barrister training in London, I, um, I... joined a small Anglican evangelical prayer group and was uh, sort of reaffirmed my faith by getting my head dunked in the water. I have it on DVD somewhere and, uh, and affirmed myself as a, as a believing Christian. That started me off right off the bat as somewhat of an anathema, as being anathematized by my fellow lawyers. You see, I got into Christian apologetics I got into, which, you know, everyone accuses of just being rhetoric, but, you know, if you're an atheist and reject the premises, uh, then you're always going to call it empty rhetoric. But it's, it's sort of like, it's, it's, it's so easy to challenge atheistic presuppositions because all of their arguments are based on error. They don't have any foundation whatsoever. So I always knew I was in a strong point, but admittedly my, maybe my delivery was left something to be granted. I can understand why I lost a lot of friends 
during this period, not because they were necessarily evil, but because I was still a very prideful lawyer. I was still coming from one of the best law schools out there, and I had this sort of belief that I was really their intellectual superior. My arguments were better, and I had the truth on my side, and I knew how to argue, but I wasn't a morally superior person. And yeah, so I bear my, I bear my share of the blame for various friends that I lost over the years. But I also got involved with public debates here in Bermuda, and um, and I sort of weighed in on the civil rights movement for uh, same-sex stuff. And I thought, you know, this was at the behest of of, uh, of a former editor of our of our mag of the newspaper, who said I would be a great ambassador for them, and that because I was Christian and I was also a lawyer, a litigator, and and a, a public speaker, and and so on. They thought I'd be the right person to do it, but it turned out to be awful because I, I realized right away that I was wading into a territory where my opponents were there to win. And uh, I always believed that I had the strength of truth on my side, and a lot of people could see that. But, you know, when people realize that rhetoric is all it's got, they've got, they're going to get nasty. And it got really nasty. Death threats, everything. Pretty much torched my career with those letters. You know, the lawyers couldn't stand me. I had no friends there. So nobody could fire me or anything. But when I left, I wasn't going to be able to come back. You know, one can be blackballed. Um, but at the time, I didn't care. I went off to do other things. My point being is that I left of my own accord. But if I'd wanted to come back and made suggestions about coming back, there would have been a lot of resistance. Now, my frustration with the Catholic Church, see, eventually, over time, I'm skipping some of the story. This isn't necessary for this review. Um, I eventually converted to the Catholic Church. Post-Vatican II, Novus Ordo. I didn't know what I know now about the current state of the Catholic Church. I was wooed by historical arguments. I was wooed by being shown the futility of sola scriptura and the need for uh, um, a referee, if you will. I was not aware until I was actually in the Catholic Church of the problems uh, that, that face it right now from the hierarchy. And believe it or not, uh, only a few years ago, I actually went to a seminary. I've had this in other videos, which I've since taken down, so I can rehearse some of these things here. I witnessed some of the things that we've heard rumors about. I won't go into those. But the single worst moment for me at that seminary was not any of the stuff that we sometimes see in the news. It was an encounter with a Monsignor in a philosophy class. He knew very well I was teaching philosophy, but, and we were talking about, he was teaching us about Descartes. He asked me what I thought of what he was saying about Descartes, and I was struck by how he was very intent on placing Descartes as the sort of founding philosopher for the modern Roman Catholic Church, which was just amazing. We'd gone from Aquinas to the father of sort of modernism in Descartes. And all I did was, was point out that I think, there, I think therefore I am is a bit of a logical fallacy. But I didn't go into it. I didn't say I was the founder of modernism or anything like that. And this Monsignor wouldn't let go. He, he started to talk about uh, what he, why he thought Descartes was so great, but he wasn't addressing the logical fallacy. And he was just hitting me with all this rhetoric. And I knew it was rhetoric, but I sort of sat there and listened to him quietly. But I think he could sense it. And he just got more and more angry. And I realized at that point that it was a quest for him for dominance. And I sat there very relaxed and composed with all the students around me getting very nervous. And I said, okay, I, I don't want to hold up the class. But he wanted to hear me say, you're right, I'm wrong. I, I'm sorry I brought up that, that objection. You're, everything you're saying is right. He wanted me to kiss the ring. He wanted me to say I saw three lights when I was being told there were four. Or maybe it's the other way around. It's that old Star Trek episode where Picard resists the indoctrination. And it was just incredible. I realized that within the church there, we had, we, we had traded 
We'd given it away, our quest for truth, and now it was all about the acquisition of power. And it truly made me come to the realization that the ecclesiastical hierarchy within the current Roman Catholic Church no longer cares about truth. It's about maintaining their power. It made me realize that what people were saying about the infiltration of the church in the post-Vatican II era, the, inter the deliberate introduction of ambiguity into the words of encyclicals, the need for subjective interpretation of those words, I said, wow, I understand the, the concept of infiltration now, how, we've, how we no longer look to the precise um, scholastic language of the pre-Vatican II church that was so careful to define things, so careful to be logically consistent and coherent. No, we'll have none of that anymore. It's all existential and experiential, but in the end, it's about power. Just boom. And it's this top-down hierarchical uh, struggle. Now, you can throw at me all you want about witch burnings and inquisitions and so on, but we all know that from an epistemological standpoint, the, the pre-modern Catholic Church was one dedicated to truth. And what we've seen since Vatican II is not. And so I left that church in disgust for the same reason that I had left the law. And left me utterly adrift. I drifted into Eastern Orthodoxy, which has some merits. But it too seemed to struggle with the idea that... that you know, you listen to the Jay Dyers of the world and it makes it so, oh, it's just the church says this. But you can find a whole lot of different catechesis uh, from different deacons and so on and priests and so on that have written things uh, that are totally in conflict with each other. So that sort of brought me back to a kind of state of occultism, the belief that there is a church. It is the Catholic church. It's the church that fought off the you know, the, the Moors, it's the church that gave us the truth of our, and, and brought together Aristotle and Aquinas, a church that is dedicated to the good, the true, and the beautiful. It's still there, but it's out there. You got to go looking for it. You got to look for people across the world that share that conviction, which is able, which is why I'm able to find common cause on certain um, issues with Protestants, Protestants that are dedicated to truth, that realize that there's a weakness in their biblical worldview of just being sola scriptura and that, you know, it ends up being a bit subjective, but, well, not a bit, but completely subjective. But at least they're trying. If, if, I, if you know that they're really trying, then I have no problem with that person, you know, depending on what they end up believing. If it comports with, you know, the, the teaching of the, ma of the magisterium and so on. Um, look, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to stop this review here because I've ended up going quite long, but I'm going to immediately make another one on, uh, on, on a different book. But, but the bottom line is I really recommend this book <laughs> to bring it all back again. It presents a very compelling, flawed character who is the, the opposite of a good man and, uh, and gives me, I read this and I'm like, yeah, this is why I left law, but it reminds me also why I left the post-conciliar church. Now, is that a reason for you to read it? Well, it's also a ripping good story, according to the, the Globe and Mail. And um, if you like Canada at all, the setting is kind of neat. I give this book, I'm not, oh, I don't want to do rankings out of 10, because I think that's very subjective. It's a fast read. The lyricism is there. That's why I read out a few bits. And there are, there are very compelling characters that are drawn out of it. And, um, you know, that belie the sort of mass market paperback look of this novel. So, with that, my friends, keep reading. And I'll see you next time. Ciao.